Welcome back to another UNC basketball recruiting podcast here on TarHeelIllustrated.com. This is THI publisher Andrew Jones, and joining me is our basketball recruiting analyst, David Sisk. And David, for the first time, we're doing a David's mailbag here on the podcast. You got a written one also accompanying this one, hitting on two different subjects because you've got a ton of questions on our premium message board. And the only way you can ask David a question is to be a member of THI. And it's just $8.33 a month. Go over to TarHillIllustrate.com, sign up, and you can interact with the one and only David Sisk all the time. You can ask him questions and he'll answer them right here. Or if he chooses to do it right, he'll do that as well. What's up, David? I appreciate you being here, uh, having me here, rather. And I appreciate all our uh, readers out there, uh, you know, putting in questions. We didn't know how it would go the first time, and, and we certainly want participation and want everybody, if they, anybody that has questions or information that they need to know, we want them to uh, feel like they can get it at Tar Heel Illustrated. So obviously, thanks to them. I'm not even sure what the final count and the number of questions there were, but we're gonna hit on five here on this uh, podcast. So let's go ahead and jump into them. I yeah, there's enough to do up. the uh, there's enough to do the video and enough to do the written part. So absolutely okay. So the first one is from Ty Heel, and he says, "Do you feel that Carolina will need a true big in the 2021 class, or will enough of this year's front line stick around next season? If so, do we have a shot with anyone other?" than Trey Kaufman? I think right now they put their eggs in the Trey Kaufman basket. Uh, and, you know, he took a visit, uh, official, unofficial rather, to North Carolina over the weekend, Virginia and North Carolina. I think he was in Chapel Hill uh, or in Charlottesville. I'll get it straight. Thursday through Saturday. And then in Chapel Hill, Saturday through Monday. Uh, and actually, when as soon as we get done, that's going to be my first phone call. Uh, and and um, so – he came out with his list today of five schools. A guy called me and he called it his list of four plus Indiana State. And it is Virginia, North Carolina, Indiana, and Purdue. Not necessarily in that order, depending on where you want him to go. And we feel like we know where that is. But um, like I said, a lot of eggs in that basket. I think North Carolina is right there. I know Corey Evans thinks that, you know, they're legitimately in the top two. And when I've talked to Trey, I've just asked him about being able to leave home. And it depends who you talk to. I, I'll use that term for the second time. I spoke of an individual in the state of Indiana who covers basketball that I trust very much. And he said that he just doesn't think he's going to leave the state but others outside, away from there, thinks he has no problem leaving the state. He told me in a recent interview that we did, was on Tar Heel Illustrated, that he had uh, no problems with that, that he would go whatever, wherever presented him the best opportunity. So, like I said, they, they need the four right now, I think more than the five. So, that's a guy that they're looking at. If uh, they don't get him, then I think they look at the next options. I think there's three out there that's recruitments are pretty open. I don't think they're close to being op being over. Excuse me while I look down. I'll pull out the phone here. I want to give you the rankings too. But in Rivals rankings, uh, and I'll go from at least to greatest, Musa Diabate, uh, a 6'9", uh, power forward from France, is ranked number 27. Wide open recruitment right now. Uh, Frank Kepnang goes to West Town School in Pennsylvania, 6'11", uh, ranked number 26, pretty much the same way, but I think he's a little farther in. And Charles Bediaco at IMG, 6'10", player, uh, he's undecided. And I've kind of looked at, at these guys as maybe, I wouldn't say fallbacks, but they weren't the first priority. And if if Kaufman decides uh, that he's not going to do that. North Carolina is not where he's going to go. I think these other guys may still be in play. And also, I would say 
the transfer portal. And we've not talked much about this, but the NCAA, I think, is going to open this thing up where you've got a one-time transfer without any penalty, without sitting out, and it will absolutely be the craziest thing we've ever seen. It'll be the Wild West. And, uh, you know, I could see Roy going that way. I do not think there's going to be a shortage shortage of options so if there is departures to the nba do i think roy will take care of that yes i do it may not it may be trey kaufman it may be somebody else if it's somebody else i don't know who but i think there are going to be more options this year than there's ever been and also reclasses don't forget about 2022 reclasses so a number of options yeah, and there are quite a few kids that it seems like more in this class are talking about it than I can remember any previous classes. Uh, a lot of they're, they're, they're still in the recruiting dead period right now, but in the last week or so, there are lots of, of kids in both sports, football and basketball, that have made visits to campuses. There was an organized football one by their by a quarterback commit down at LSU where there were a bunch of kids in Baton Rouge. Obviously, they can't see the coaches, but they can see the stadium, they can see campus. Uh, UNC had a football kid that came up for a visit. Uh, so with Kaufman making the, the trip down to Charlottesville and, and, and Chapel Hill, can you gauge anything from him actually doing that? And that's the first basketball kid that I'm aware of that, that has made one of these visits, especially with that whole talk about some people saying he won't leave Indiana. But he actually made the effort on his own time, his own dime, to make that trip. Well, and that's a great point. On uh, His own time, his own dime. And I couldn't have said it any better. Um, I know uh, in talking to an individual about DeMarco Dunn, he said, look to see if he is going to do any unofficial visits, If he, and that might tell this month if he visited North Carolina and Chapel Hill, that would bode very well for them. And by the way, I spoke with DeMarco Dunn today, and uh, just to get off the subject briefly, he has not made his mind up when he's going to announce uh, still – says he doesn't know the school yet, so uh, he's not there yet. We thought it could be in the middle of the month or the end of the month. But back to Trey, I think that is a huge issue that if a, a player, like you say, is going to do it on, on his own time and his own dollar, uh, that's big. And, you know, North Carolina and Virginia were the only two places he did that to and were the only two out-of-state schools uh, that he decided on. So I think it bodes well for each. It certainly bodes well for North Carolina, who, like I said, is considered to be uh, right there with Indiana, uh, if not first, a very close second, and, and probably right in the middle of a dogfight there. All right, our next question comes from Rob Jones. He says, considering you also cover UK, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on where the recruitment stand for prospects that both schools are actively recruiting, not considering any school except UK and UNC. Which school do you think stands a better chance today at signing Sky Clark and Hunter Salas, who we have written about and talked about a lot the last few months here on THI? Man, that's a great question. And, you know, Corey Evans went on a podcast in uh, Kentucky uh, over the weekend with Sean Smith and said that he felt like Kentucky would get one of the two between uh, Hunter Salas and Scott Clark and North Carolina would get the other. So, you know, that might be a morsel there that people might be interested in. I can kind of see that, and I brought up that idea if that could happen. I think Jared Hardy, we spoke over the weekend, some messages, and I kind of floated that one out there to him. That it could be one or the other. Of course, the last time I thought that uh, was, uh, you know, about Apollo Bancaro and Brandon Huntley Hatfield, uh, with two other schools and neither one of them went where I thought they would go. So, you know, I'm, I'm batting zero right now, <laughs> but I really, but yeah, uh, here's the thing. I think that I'll be very surprised if Scott Clark doesn't go anywhere besides North Carolina, or Kentucky and Corey has doubled, you know, he put in a future cast for North Carolina over the weekend. We need to address that. Corey is very tied in to the Clark family. I went to an event in Memphis, a, a uh, camp in July. It's the only road trip I've made this summer. 
and I went there and Corey was there and he was sitting right beside Kenny Clark, Sky's dad the whole time. He, he talks, uh, he's got an open line to Sky and he knows what's going on there. He doubled down since the podcast, I think said today, I, I've not had a chance to go look at what he said, but what I've been told, he said that he was more sure of North Carolina now than ever. So he really believes that uh, North Carolina is sitting in good there. Now, the question with Hunter Salas, does that mean that North Carolina wouldn't have a shot? I can't say that because we still don't know what Sky's going to do in 2022. Uh, he's 2022 now. If he doesn't reclassify, you know, that has no impact on on Hunter Salas. Yeah, so, and I, I was going to ask about that because either or, you can get them both and they never play together. Let me tell so, you something that Roy, and like I say, probably people in North Carolina didn't know about what Corey had said on the podcast. I'm going to throw you another morsel that people in North Carolina probably, they may know, and I'm sure they do, or once they think about it, they'll say this makes sense. But I'm going to throw you one out there that right. an individual told me. Hunter Salas and Scott Clark are a lot alike. They've got, and Kennedy Chandler was the same way. Great, a great parent situation, a great family situation. There's no agents. There's no handlers. There's no AAU coaches running it. There's no street agents. There's, there's none, no hustlers. There's none of that. It's the, it's the family. And this guy told me, he says, Roy Williams will just kicks butt and takes names when it comes down to recruiting the player and his family. He said a lot of coaches do not know how to do that. They're so used to working through this pipeline that when it comes down to just talking to the kid or talking to the mom and dad, they don't know how to do it. Now, they may know originally, but they don't know how to extend that and build a, a sincere relationship, and Roy does. And, and conversely, some of the kids that Roy's lost in the past have been kids that had a lot of handlers or yeah, one or two yeah. primary handlers. And, you know, we've had people ask on here, yeah, right, you, you said that uh, Kendy Chandler was going to get another Zoom call and all that. I didn't talk to Kendy. I talked to his dad. And I'm telling you, his dad could not wait till that next Monday to have another Zoom call with Roy Williams. He loved it. But the son was, get, was ready to get it over with. And, you know, and then two days later, he committed to Tennessee. I think – I don't doubt anything the dad told me. They were on different wavelengths. So, the question is, even the families – I know they're tight, but are they on different pages? And that's a – I mean, that's a big question you have to ask yourself. But Hunter Salas and Sky Clark, both very tight-knit families. Mom, dad, I know uh, Sky's got the brother – uh, I'm not sure about Hunter Salas as far as siblings go, but Roy builds that. So when Roy does a Zoom call, he says, okay, it's not just me and you. You're going to put everybody in your family on a Zoom call. I'm going to put every coach here. So you've got, you know, I'm watching the NBA game right now. You know, you've got all those faces around the court now that they do it. I think that's what a Zoom call with Roy Williams looks like. You've got faces all over the place between family members and coaches. So they want everybody to feel like they're a part of it and they're involved. And I'm telling you, man, Roy's tough to beat in those situations. I'm not going to thud any names here, but, you know, when the access that we have sometimes after games, there are, you know, prospects around. And, and I've seen Roy interact with bro younger brothers, younger sisters before he goes to the mom and dad and even the – the main prospect himself. So uh, I kind of set, seen that a little bit up close a few times and, and it's always cool. And I think that that's real Roy. I think Roy is at his, almost at his hat, he's his happiest when he wins basketball games. But he I know, loves right. that element. And I've talked to people before that have told me stories like you are, the kids that, you know, when you ask them when they're juniors, well, you know, go, can you take us back to your crib and why'd you go to Carolina? And they go right into what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah you, you know, family, and it's legitimate. They're not a lot of kids use the word family, and I'm not saying it's not family like in other places. I just know that the kids that I've covered that play, played at Carolina, I'm not going to talk about any kids at any other schools. When they say that family thing to Roy Williams, it is genuine, and they mean yeah. it 100. percent Yeah, and Nate Bradley, who's Jaden Bradley's dad in Charlotte, he was really the first one that tipped me off to this this year, and, and you know, in covering Carolina and. 
he he told me, he said, you know, he would not do a Zoom call, Roy wouldn't, until the brother was home. <laughs> until he was there and then you know he had played for uh, for another school last year and graduated and he wanted to know how the season went how they coped with covid what they did at their school when COVID. he said you know he was interested and he recruited the you know recruits the rest of the family as hard as he recruits the player you know the most the most amazing part of this story is that roy's doing zoom calls because he, he still calls twitter tweeter He's he he is definitely uh, very comfortable not being the most technologically inclined. And maybe the most impressive thing is that you and I are doing Zoom calls. Exactly. Well, that's the thing. I would tell Roy, look, if I can do it, you can do it, because I'm like one notch below. That's why the staff calls me Captain Technology. <laughs> Jake Sarna, our third question. Jake Sarna asked, "Hey, at David Sisk, I'm kind of getting the feeling that Kaufman is seriously thinking about UNC." In my opinion, believe that once he visits, he'll pull the trigger off. We're going obviously back to Trey Goffman a little bit right now. I just don't know much about him. Is he a good outside shooter? I've read that he's more of a four, an undersized four. I'm hoping he can shoot. How is he defensively? I remember reading that Virginia's Tony Bennett only offers recruits that are already really good defenders in high school. So I'm assuming he's good defensively. What is your take on him? I feel like out of all of our offers, I know the least about him, kind of lukewarm towards him. So I appreciate you filling us in a little bit more on Trey Kaufman. So we did the recruitment Trey Kaufman side. Now we're doing Trey Kaufman, the ball player, the well-rounded ball player on this. I, I need to watch. I'm going to be honest. I need to watch more of him. He is good defensively. How great of a stretch he is uh, and shooting, that's something I need to look at. But like I said, I know this, and I promise I will go back on the site, and I need to watch more of him, and I will address that uh, on the message boards. Uh, so, you know, be looking for that, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll address that to you specifically. Uh, but um, like I said, North Carolina, I think, from, from looking at the roster making up, from people that have really studied it that I've talked to and what I'm looking at, making sure that we're all on the right page here. Uh, I, I think that four, they feel like they're going to have players returning back at the five. So that four spot is really what they need. And I mean, the proof's in the pudding here. If you look at post players that they've offered and they've really settled down on, I mean, they've offered a couple of wings. So, but you look at the inside at the bigger guys of him being a four, uh, like I said earlier, they put the eggs in the Trey Kaufman basket. So that tells you what Roy Williams uh, thinks about Trey Kaufman. When it comes to the inside players, he is option one, two, and three. Mad Drummer, go to our fourth question. He's a, uh, he asked, okay, I'll keep it simple. We have what I think is Roy's best all-around class of freshmen in a very long time. So part one, as far as freshmen only, who do you think will be the biggest surprise? Part two of the returning guys, who will show the most improvement from last year's season? Really looking forward to this season and your input as well. Now, this isn't recruiting, so to speak, but this is certainly also. Yeah, when we got that's that's fine. You know, for anybody in the future when we do these, yeah. you know, if you want to know about the team, recruiting, you know, what my favorite ice cream is, whatever, we'll we'll and, and, that's one of the, and just so people that are watching right now, that's one of the reasons why we chose this one as well. We're we're gonna really this is gonna be more than just hardcore recruiting stuff because if we want to do a lot of these, you can only do so many questions about a program that doesn't cast a very wide net. So we're going to be a little more inclusive. And this will give you and me an opportunity during the season to talk a lot about the heels as they go through their season. Okay. So if I had to look at a player here and, and make sure I'm right here, you were asking which players of the freshmen, the first part was which freshmen uh, might be the biggest surprise. Is that yes. right? Yes. Uh, I'm going to look – at maybe R.J. Davis. Hmm. And the reason I say that is because I'm not sure about Caleb Love, and we've addressed this in, in the piece we've just done on the scouting report, about Caleb Love at the point guard spot. Caleb Love 
is a great talent. And in today's game of scoring point guards, if you look it up in an encyclopedia, Caleb loves pitchers beside him. Uh, he, you know, in naming names, Dame Lillard uh, and others who do that, who can score at that position uh, and just tear defenses apart. Caleb loves a special score, but how well can he run a team? You know, I've, I've heard people tell me that, that uh, you know, I've watched a lot of him in person, and, and especially out on the AAU trail, that, you know, they tried a little bit of point guard with him at Bradley Bill Elite, and it just didn't work as well as it did when he played the two. And, you know, he's just a natural scorer. So here's the thing. Does he have the talent to do it? Yes. But here's a guy who is a high uh, – just a higher order score uh, who and, and a high volume shooter who looks to score first and pass second. Well, you know, if you're going to play point guard, you've got to do it the other way around. Yeah. Uh, he, he's going to get his, but you've got to get other people involved. Now he could do this. He's got the talent to do it, but more than anything, it's just a mental makeup. So, you know, I look at, at, at Davis, he's more that true point guard, and, uh, you know, was good enough to be in Rivals Top 75. I think he needs to get a little stronger. He came in, I think, like 160 pounds out of high school. So, obviously, he's going to have to bulk up some to get ready for a college game. But I think that need might be there and that he might be the guy who could uh, perhaps fill it. What, what was the second question? I'm sorry. Uh, the, the, let, me, let me comment on that real fast before we go to the second part of that question. Um, it's interesting that you say that because Jacob and I did a podcast the other day, kind of looking ahead to, before they start practice here in a few weeks. And I'm, I've been conditioned to think of Caleb Love more as the point guard or lead guard, and RJ Davis maybe as a guy that comes in and plays a little bit too and also backs up at the one. It's an interesting point that you make because I'll tell you, the, you got to have your point, your point guard has to be connected to the other four on the floor, certainly or at most programs, but certainly when you play. For Williams, and I think I've shared this story with you before, but I'll very quickly uh, share it again. And for those watching that, that maybe haven't heard this before, uh, you know, when Kobe White came in a couple of years ago, Roy was, was kind of the Kobe Seventh Woods thing. We kind of knew that Kobe was going to eventually take over and be the guy, but he still had to work out some, work through some stuff and beat out Seventh and end up going from 22 and 18 minutes a game to 32 and 8 minutes a game, that kind of thing. And for me, it was when they lost to Kentucky and Chicago. They didn't play very well that day, but they still only lost by like eight or something like that. And in the locker room after the game, that was when I realized that Kobe had kind of reached that point where Roy needed him mentally on the floor. He was talking a lot about what, what they as a team didn't do well. This guy didn't do that right. You know, this, this area of the floor, we weren't doing this right. And he wasn't pointing fingers. It was just he, he was expressing his understanding of all the different things that didn't go right for them that day which to me is what where the point guard for Roy Williams needs to be at all times. Joel Berry was always like that. When Marcus played, Page was the point, he was like that. Kind of Marshall, Ty Lawson eventually got to that point, and that's, he was ACC Player of the Year when he was at that, at that stage. And, and I don't think Cole Anthony was really ever there a year ago. And so what you're saying makes a lot of sense, that if R.J. Davis can get to that point quicker and is a better option to get to that point, it might make more sense to have him on the ball and move Caleb over, and Caleb can just worry about scoring because a guy that shoots too much at the point with this team, with the options they have inside, might not be a great mesh. Now, the talent is not the issue in Caleb Love. Yeah. It's just him playing a different game and making adjustments than he's ever had to. Yeah. And we knew what a great North Carolina Tar Heel Eddie Fogler used to say <laughs> his favorite day of the year was the first day of practice when all these freshmen came in and thought they knew the game, just get brought down to humil uh, uh, parts of humility that they've never known. And uh, now, if he makes that adjustment, and he could very well do it, you can forget everything I said. You know, RJ, like you say, RJ will probably get the scraps because Caleb loves <laughs> that good. Uh, it, it's going to be fun to see how this shakes out because I love going into a season with unknowns. It's more interesting to cover as a journalist than when you kind of know what this team's going to be like and you just sort of, they're sort of waiting for March in a sense. Part two of Matt Drummer's question is, are the returning guys who will show the most improvement from last year to this season? 
Man, that is a good question. It's a really good question. Um, you know, looking at the lineup, and I went, I've gone back and, and, and really kind of studied this. Um, you know, Armando Baycott could play better and his numbers be nowhere near – not be – I'll take that back. Could play better and his numbers could not improve because there's going to be more depth this year. And he's a guy that, that I could kind of see. I really liked him coming out of high school. And I think last year, what he averaged about nine and eight, if I'm not mistaken, right around there. But uh, there was so much pressure on all those guys. Uh, so, you know, he's a guy that I can see as a sophomore, just making that next step. You're not asking him to play more minutes than he's physically capable of. You're not asking him to do more than he's physically capable of. So, I think that's tough. I think outside of Garrison Brooks could, you know, obviously he could tell you probably always wants to, would want to do better, but I thought he was really good last year. And I think that, you know, just pick one out of the rest of them who it could be because I think you look at last year's team, obviously, I mean, they all had room to make strides, but let's not fool ourselves, man. It's going to be a lot about the freshman class coming in this year and making an impact. Yeah. I agree with you about Armando. I think the key for him is becoming consistent. He's got to ref – I know that he's been working on refining certain things. He worked out with Ed Davis for a while uh, back in the late spring, early summer, got a lot out of that, uh, learning to do things with both hands consistently and also just consistent performance. Uh, uh, some people said effort. I, I'm not sure I'm going to say effort. I just think it was a challenge at times as he was trying – as he was learning to mature – during the course of an extremely difficult season that included him playing on a very bad ankle for a while and Cole goes down. I mean, every time those, those guys kind of felt like, well, wow, maybe we can sort of see some light. Someone got hurt yeah. and they lost a the game. They shouldn't have lost. And it was such a challenge. I think a clearer focus and a little bit, another year of maturity, a little more refinement in his game. We're going to see a much more consistent Armando Baycott. Also, I think Leaky I don't, Black. Let me play this too. I, I just I want to see Leaky Black stop. healthy. Um, go ahead, go ahead. I don't necessarily believe in sophomore slumps in college. I do in the pros. But yeah. I don't necessarily believe, especially with basketball, I just think you got young guys who get more comfortable. Now, I, I can see it in the pros where teams learn how to adjust and they're coached up over the summer. You see it in football all the time. Some guy comes in and he has an incredible season in the NFL his first year, and then everybody just watches film on him all throughout the offseason, and they know how to defend him a little bit more the next year. Yep. They know his tendencies. And they, they've got defensive adjustments. I, I don't think you can look at that North Carolina team last year and say, man, we got to stop this and that, because like you say, it was just such a tough year. Yeah. And I just believe you've got a young kid, 19, 20-year-old kid, that's just going to get better. Yeah, I, I agree. I'm going to throw in Leaky Black there as well, just yeah. uh, for, for a mention, because uh, Leaky – you know, he wasn't healthy. And uh, Roy said in the summer, last summer, about 15 months ago, 14 months ago, said, I think Leakey could be an NBA player. And a lot of people's expectations shot through the roof about Leakey. And, and what they ended up seeing was a guy that was injured all throughout practice before the season, played almost the entire season with turf toe. And it, it, to his credit, he didn't make excuses, but he was never 100%. He had other issues too. Then he went through a stretch where he was the starting point guard for seven or eight games. He started at the, he started at the two, the three, the, uh, the, the one, the two, the three, and the four in, in ACC games. So, and then you throw in everything else. I just think, again, clear mind, healthy body, I think a, a better understanding of his role, playing with better guys around him. I think Leaky Black could have a really good year this year as well. Final question comes from, from the thrill. And he says, do you see UNC going after a spring commit, true big man, if it looks like two of our underclass bigs will leave early? And if so, any thoughts on who? We've addressed this a little bit already, and you got a lot of questions, but let's kind of put a bow on this uh, part of the topic, conversation. 
I think of all, if I look at the bigs here, I think Armando, uh, excuse me, I'm sorry, Garrison Brooks, I'm sorry. Garrison Brooks has the best chance, obviously. Uh, he's a senior anyway, so I guess that. But, but even if he was an underclassman, I think he could, he could make that move. Um, Armando. And people forget that Garrison, a lot of people, I've gotten a few emails when people talk about guys who can leave early. A couple people have said Garrison because he exploded in the middle of last season. After being sort of a just sort of sort of a filler player, if you will, a role player for a couple of years, so that's an easy thing to to think sometimes. Although some people might also say he's been around forever because a four year college player seems like an eternity right. these days. Right. If Armando is good enough to go pro after a sophomore year, and I'm gonna sound like a prophet from what I just said a while ago for saying he would be the most improved player. So. I, I look at this, I, I don't, I've watched Walker Kessler. I don't think Walker Kessler is a one and done type. I think it's going to take, and I think he's going to be a really good college player. He could be good next year, but I think just with his body, uh, athleticism, all that, I know it's seven feet, but I think he's going to have to make an adjustment. I, I think he's at least a two year college player. Um, what about Dayron? Now, here's the thing. I love Dayron's talent, but but here's the issue. Players like Dayron Sharp, the NBA is not looking for guys like that right now. And that's the thing to keep in mind. Yeah, they may be good, they may be really good college players, but what is what does the NBA want? The NBA wants players who can who's who are positionless defensively that can switch out on guards and stay in front of them. You know, I'm watching uh, uh, a little bit of the NBA game right now, Milwaukee, Miami. I've got that on behind the screen here. And if you would have ever told me that Bam out of Iowa would be as good as he is, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I would have uh, taken you by the hand and, and taken you to a counselor, uh, you know, and just to see him improve. But even guys like, you know, Lopez uh, uh, for Milwaukee, you know, you, you think about him just being a kind of a big, stiff guy around the bucket, and he's a legitimate three-point shooter. So even these big guys uh, who weigh 260, 265, they're able to step out and shoot the ball. They, I look at a guy like Dwight Howard, um, and I coached Corey Brewer. And Corey, when he was playing for the Rockets, every time they went to Memphis or Atlanta or somewhere like that, you know, we, we'd, we'd go to the games. And Dwight Howard was on that team at that time. So they had Harden, Dwight Howard, Corey. And Harden pl hated playing with Dwight Howard because Dwight Howard couldn't screen and roll. He couldn't play dunk or spot. All, all he did was get down on the block and turn around and face up and post. And James Harden's got no driving lane to the bucket. And Harden hated playing with him. And – so big guys, that's not what, you know, that are playing with their back to the bucket. That's not what the NBA is looking for. So I said all that to say, you know, day on, yeah, I think he's very talented. I've already said I think he's going to be tremendous. But is that the package that the NBA needs right now? So when I look at that, I do think he'll probably be back for his sophomore. I, I, I'm leaning that way. I think he'll be back for his sophomore year. Walker Kessler, I think, will be back. So if you look at those guys, Armando remains to be seen. So, you know, you're looking at some a seven footer uh, in Kessler. You're looking at um, they're on about two four six ten two forty five. Um, you know, uh, Armando at six ten. The jury will be out on him. So you can see why they really not try to need that. They need that four. I don't necessarily know that they need another seven foot center. I, that's, I think that's why well, they're looking yeah, and, and let me throw a name at you. And let me throw another name at you that uh, uh, people probably are not even thinking about, but Sterling Manley's still in the program. And the, the plan with him is to get him healthy. And he missed all the last season. He got, poor guys had so many injuries and uh, he's such a nice guy. He has such an amazing attitude to deal with the things that he's been going through. But when he's been healthy, he's averaged 0.51 points a minute and 0.39 rebounds a minute when he's been healthy. And a lot of those numbers are against ACC teams. 
a couple of years ago when he was a freshman, they went up and picked up a huge win late in the year at Syracuse, and he was enormous in one stretch in the second half that game. A lot of Carolina fans, and you might remember, David, when they went to they went to Knoxville and beat a really good Tennessee team on a Sunday afternoon, and Garrison and Sterling, the two freshman bigs down low, combined for something like 19 and 18, you know, playing that spot, and Sterling was really good that night. It, the whole point with him is to get him healthy, and if he is healthy, I don't think they're thinking he's going to be much of a factor this year and be great for them and for him if he could, if he is. But they're thinking 21-22, they'll still be in the program, and he can give them that length, that seven-footer, and that knowledge, and that mature kid uh, who can can kind of give them a little bit of something else that they need right there in the middle. And Roy will one take thing, that because he loves those big guys. One thing I probably do more than anybody is I, I really look ahead into the mock drafts, and I know things can change, but I really like to look at those and kind of get a, an idea – uh, 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 cause you'll know, they'll, they'll fool you sometimes. You'll be looking at a guy and you wouldn't even think about him being the NBA and you'll look up and he's a, a first round projection. And those things don't change a lot of time. It's really tough to play your way in. And then there's other guys that you think are going to be there, uh, in the first round and they're nowhere near going on, on, on the board. So it kind of tells you, you get, I guess, channeled in to what you see in a college game and, and when they say the NBA and college are two different games they really are so there's a specific thing that they're looking for so and I'll be doing that I follow Jonathan Gavani a lot on ESPN he's the guy really that uh, I know NBA front offices think very highly of uh, with his eye for talent and, and uh, his mock draft. So that's a guy I watch very closely too and just try to say, okay, who's playing their way in? Who's playing their way out? Because, you know, the first 30 picks in the NBA draft, the first round, that's guaranteed money. Yeah. But even guys now, you know, they, they still see some uh, some lucrative uh, situations, even if they go in the second round. So I used to think, hey, man, if a guy doesn't is not the top 30, you don't have guaranteed money, come back to school. But – there's with a G League now and, and, and the different contracts, the two-way contracts and deals and all that, or you can go internationally and make so much money. There's so many options out there. So it's but but I I really think if you're not in the top sixty where you could go at least second round, you know, and have that shot, then then you're probably wasting your time a little bit. I, I'm gonna throw a name at you that I'm I know you know this guy. Um I realized when Don Reed ended up making it in the NBA after watching him play at Georgetown, and I thought he's not even that very good Georgetown player. He's like an average Georgetown player. And he ended up playing, I don't know how long in the NBA, but that's when I realized that unless you're in the industry of basketball and you've been watching both college and NBA for years up close and you understand what the league is looking for. And I covered the Bobcats where they begin the Hornets again. And I saw a lot of stuff up close, and I kind of figured a little bit of that out, but certainly not at that level in, in any way, shape, or form. But I realized with Don Reed, you cannot watch college basketball and say that guy's going to play in the NBA. There are very few dudes that you can look at in the college game and say that's absolutely an NBA player. So when he made it and made a lot of money and stuck and was in box scores 10 years later, I threw my arms and said, I quit. <laughs> I've, I've got a, a, a friend of mine in Oklahoma City and who's in the scouting department who texted me on a player uh, that is that I've seen quite a bit that's projected by everybody in the top 20, projected by most in the lottery. And he's like, am I missing something here? I don't see it. And it's, it's kind of some questions that I've had. Uh, so you've got guys who are, even, like I said, projected to go lottery perhaps and that's not a slam dunk either. And I'll tell you something that's interesting. If you like players, if you if you this is kind of a hobby for you, and you like to look at players and you say, well, I'm going to look at, at Daron Sharp, and I'm going to go back, and I'm going to compare him to a player in college or high school, go back and look at that guy and get on Wikipedia or whatever and pull his name up and look at how many years he was in the NBA G League or he, he played – 35 games for the Dallas Mavericks one year and 52 the next and three games the next year. And then he's been in Europe for the last six. 
And man, it's tough. I'm talking about household college names that you have sworn would have made over a hundred million dollars yep. playing college basketball and their entire uh, pro basketball rather in their entire career, NBA career, they didn't play a hundred games. You know, they had a, you know, they were on a two way contract or something. They didn't get re-signed and now they're playing overseas. Really? It's, it really is amazing. Players. If you look, go back and look, if you talk to a 25 year old now and you say, look at the all American team from 20 years ago, 15 years ago, they won't know who half two thirds of those guys are in football. Higher percentage of those guys, at least, you know, in the, in the NFL for a few years, make a little bit of money. Basketball is just a different deal. Hey, and, I'm uh, and, and it's probably more so now because you have so many older guys that make all American teams and make all conference teams and power conferences. A lot of it's because they're just the smarter players on the floor. They've kind of figured it out. They're more resilient. So all those things kind of help them through. And, 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 you know, a guy like Garrison Brooks, it was the middle of his third year in college when he started to trust a lot of his game. A lot of dudes don't stick around long enough for that. And he ended up being all conference. I have no idea what Garrison's going to do. Well, and, and here's the but thing. he's a perfect example of that. Here's the thing, too. And, you know, I've, I've had people send me messages and asking about Roy's recruiting and everything. And there's kind of an, a little bit of an angst around some people that ask me these questions about, North Carolina not having rolling out a ton of studs in the NBA right now. And my question is, would you rather have that or would you rather have those na national championship, and those national championship games? Because if you look at that, that Carolina team, uh, you know, those guys are probably not going to, they're not all going to be in the NBA all-star game, but man, those were great college teams. They went to two championship games. They won one. And, uh, to me, you have to find a way. I think the key to win, winning big in college basketball is one thing. You've got to find a way for your team to get old. And, you know, if you're getting a bunch of top five guys that one and done, one and done, one and done, one and done, I, I'm just not – I just don't think if, if, if your ultimate goal is to go to the Final Four and win national championships, and that's what your big goal as a program is – I just don't think you can roll in one and duns every year. Just just pump them out. I think you've got – man, I want guys – I want 20, 21-year-old guys out there on the court that can play. I want a team full of men, not a team full of boys. Well, look at most of the national champions in the one-and-done era. Mm -hmm. That's what they are. Oh, yeah. UVA, UVA, Carolina. Um, other, you know, Duke was young, but they had just a couple hey, old Duke's guys. A couple that. old guys in that team. Duke's got into that. I used to hear Duke fan. And you remember when Bo Ryan said it uh, in a Final Four a couple of years. Remember he called Duke a one and done school, and boy, they just uh, tore the walls down. You know that they called Duke a one and done. Well, uh, he was right. Yeah. And you see, and, and and you see, they've not. I mean, every year. They, they're, they're picked to win a national championship. And I know Coach K's got his five rings and all that. But, I mean, if you look the past few years, I mean, they've they, they've not played up to that level. They've had really good teams, and I'm not knocking them. I'm just saying, you know, even with him, as great, great a coach as he is, it's tough, man. It is tough to roll a bunch yeah. of freshmen out there and, and, and win everything. I remember – up to the the McGetty brand William Avery period that they didn't have anybody leave early and they were praised for that because he it got some guys transferred the Billy McCaffrey's of the world but most of the guys stayed there they played there four years they finished and that was the culture of the program but it has changed a lot and it's changed a lot really since Kyrie Irving got there uh they didn't have any uh, the only one and done up to Kyrie I think was Wall Dang in 2004 uh, so anyway, this is a UNC basketball podcast, not a other teams one. But, yeah, but we, just, we just but lost every helps. listener we had. Pardon? <laughs> we just lost every listener we had. Yeah, well, you know, our, well, we our, my subscribers like, knew. We that, didn't, but we didn't say anything good about them. So yeah, <laughs> my subscribers uh, know that I covered Duke for a long time too, and I, and I and I think a lot of them understand that that really has helped my perspective in covering Carolina as well. That's why you also doing the Kentucky basketball recruiting helps your perspective of UNC and they go after a lot of the same guys. I actually think it's a really, really uh, healthy approach to have both of those and not just one. 
Well, but I, I want to say this too. I'm not, I don't think anybody will, is, is going to get nauseous of listening, hearing me just say Kentucky, Kentucky, Kentucky on here because I'm not going to address it unless asked about yeah. it. You know, this is for North Carolina. You can learn from that. But like I said, I'm in, in the same way over there. So, but, but I'm, I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to go down that road. Uh, so, you know, I, I understand. You, 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 hopefully, you, like you say, those experiences will sharpen your eye and hopefully give you a little expertise. Absolutely. That, that, that helps, you know, provide information for the subscribers at Tar Heel Illustrated. That's our Absolutely. Opinion. Absolutely. We got a lot of experience between the two of us. We've seen a lot of stuff, so that definitely helps. He is David Sisk. I'm Andrew Jones. You've been watching another UNC basketball recruiting podcast here on TarHeelIllustrated.com. The mailbag version, which means we could go in a lot of different directions, and we will every time we do one of these. Thanks a lot, David. Hey, and the questions that we did not answer, I may start working on it tonight. I'm getting ready to call Trey Kaufman. If I don't get him, I'm going to get to work here, and we'll have we'll try to have the other questions up this week. Absolutely. Good stuff. Thanks, David. Thanks Thank for stopping you. by. Thank you. Yes, sir.